産庁は同意されましたがまだですかこれから一緒に明治神宮に参拝して決断なさいそれは時間稼げだ待てどうせ頭か貴様だあのねどうせ待て貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴様だ貴The film covers historic events from April to August 15, 1945, the date of Emperor Hirohito's surrender broadcast. The movie offers a fascinating window into the political situation in Japan in the last months of the war, as certain defeat was settling in with the nation's politicians and generals. The film focuses on Kantaro Suzuki, who was prime minister for four months during this time. He was a former Japanese admiral and 77 years old on becoming prime minister. He sought to resolve the split within the Japanese imperial cabinet over the surrender of Japan and fulfill the terms of unconditional surrender Emperor Hirohito accepted. The task of winning over the military to agree to the surrender was no easy one, and his efforts to do so resulted in two assassination attempts. The movie features many captivating characters, the most of which is War Minister Kurichika Nami. Nami was a general in the Imperial Japanese Army, who was appointed War Minister in April of 1945. Nami was outspoken against Japan's surrender, and much of Japan's fanatical army celebrated his appointment as War Minister, hoping for a final battle on mainland Japan that would prevent surrender. Nami's character is deep, three dimensional, a fanatic, but one who is also loyal to the Emperor. And the emperor's will for Japan to surrender. Anami had loyalties to the emperor, the government, and the fanatical army, which wanted to fight on despite the emperor's surrender. The balancing act of keeping Japan's political and military institutions working together at the end of the war was nearly an impossible task, and observing it through the lens of Anami offers a valuable and overlooked perspective. The film further allows a personal perspective. Anami had a family to care for and loyal staff. He further had a personal legacy to consider. He wrestled with the personal and the political, all while coming to terms with his own death. He committed suicide after signing Japan's August 14th surrender document. His suicide, as portrayed in the film, wasn't a fanatical, thoughtless act as portrayed in many films, but something an intelligent man would have to struggle with, weighing cultural pressure against self preservation. Emperor Hirohito is further brought to life in the film in a refreshingly three dimensional way. Though still a stoic character, he's shown as personable and thoughtful. His confrontation with former Prime Minister and warmonger Hideki Tojo is a satisfying scene. Though the excellent acting and characters often overshadow the actual political events in the film, the historical timeline is done justice. Though at times can feel rushed or confusing if one has little understanding of the Japanese political system or certain figures. But any viewer should achieve an appreciation for the political climate and gravity of the time and situation. The climax of the film covers the Kyujo incident, the actual attempted military coup d'etat, taking place on the night of August 14th, 15th, 1945, just before the Emperor's announcement of surrender to the Allies. The coup was a failure and unable to gain enough army support. The event and figures involved in the coup highlights the spectrum of views held in Japan in the final days of the war, as even many of the most fanatical of soldiers could not look away from defeat and death, which was now casting a shadow over every inch of the country. All right, I'm Johnny. Do check out The Emperor in August. It also goes by the title Japan's Longest Day, inspired by the original movie by the same title from 1967. Also, an excellent film. Check them both out. Like and subscribe to support the channel. And we'll see you, whoever you are, next time.